Today we're going to continue our discussions on interpreting scores, and today we're going to focus on criterion reference scores. So let's start off with a discussion of what are criterion reference scores. So when we're talking about criterion reference, what do we mean by that? What are criterion reference scores? Were there scores that are based upon the content that's mastered? When we're talking about criterion reference, we're talking about scores that are based upon a set of standards. So most of what we do in schools are criterion referenced, right? So most of our classrooms tests are criterion referenced. And today we're really going to focus on those state accountability type tests. So typically we're given as a raw score the number of questions answered correctly or percentage, the percentage of questions answered correctly. Those might be weighted, right? So on a classroom test we have our essay questions that are weighted more than our multiple choice questions, perhaps. So some examples might be things like the classroom tests, um, career inventories, like those tests that you take at the, you know, in beauty magazines that tell you, you know, what kind of, you know, colors you should wear or whatever. And, um, and then FSAs and the EOCs. Um, so FSAs, Florida Standards Assessment, and the EOCs, the end of course exams, the state exams, and the state of Florida are we're going to consider criterion referenced for this example. So let's talk a little bit more about the FSAs in more detail. So those of you who are not from Florida will give you a little bit more background on this. So they stand for the Florida Standards Assessment, um, and they replace the Florida Comprehensive Assessment Test, the FCAT. So those of you who went to school back in the day were probably more familiar with the FCATs. Um, and the FSAs are based upon the Common Core standards um, and the Florida um, Sunshine, Sunshine State standards were adapted from the Common Core standards. So once the Florida adopted the Common Core standards, we had to update our test to reflect the new set of standards. And they are in English Language Arts from grades 3 through 8 and mathematics grade 3 through 8. Um, and the mathematics ends at grade 8 because starting then we have the algebra and geometry end of course exams. So we um, we stop doing yearly mathematics tests and then they're by course rather than by grade level. Um, we also have the FCATs and the EOCs that are based upon the other state standards that don't have to do with English language arts and math. So those are the next generation Sunshine State standards. Um, the FCAT in grades five and eight science and then we have, and the reason that's still the FCAT is because it's still based upon the old set of standards. And then we have the EOC in Bio 1, U.S. History, and Civics. Okay, so the question formats um, for the um, FSAs, it, it, which is a computer-based test, we'll talk a little bit about what that means um, for it being computer-based and how that might pose challenges for some groups of students. So these computer-based tests, 25 to 50 percent of these items, depending on the test, are what we call technology enhanced. And those can include test item types such as editing task choice, editing, selecting hot text, drag and drop, open response, multi-select, graphic response, item display, equation editor, matching, and table items. So let's talk and look at what those kinds of items look like. So here's one example. Um, so you can see it says the product of two numbers and the difference is two. So first off, kids do have a piece of scratch paper. They can kind of figure out what that means. You have to write the two numbers. So you click on that and then you have to um, do that. And you can kind of see that if I need to use a fraction or an equation, um, I'm sorry, or an exponent or a subset, you can kind of see I can use different equations in this equation editor. Um, here's an example of a um, essay item. So here's here's all of the reading I would have to do, and you can see here there's there were some multiple choice questions, and then in part B, select two words or phrases from the passage that help readers determine the meaning of the word. So what I would have to do is know that as I scrolled along with my cursor, different words would be highlighted, and then I would click on those words to um, to select them. But if I never moved my cursor over those words, I wouldn't know that they would be highlighted. So you can see that students that have more experience with a computer are going to probably do better on these items. So it's possible that I'm measuring maybe more proficiency with the computer than I am ability to answer the question. And I want to point out here that these are all coming from the FSA website. So if you want to play around with these questions more, you can just log on to the Florida Department of Education. You can also see these same items that I pulled up screenshots of too. 
Um, and here's another example. So this is another kind of reading passage. And then here's the essay. Notice I have to read this whole passage. And then these are just the directions on how to write the essay. So think about the reading load here to write my essay. There's a lot of reading that goes along with this as well. So we want to think about that when we're thinking about our English language learners, our students that might have um, learning disabilities when we're thinking about item types. And here's another example. So for this example, in order to answer this question, I have to click on these numbers, hold on to it, and drag them and drop them into these spaces. And that might sound pretty easy to us who use computers all the time, but again, if we're thinking about a third grader, this, this task might not be quite so simple. And again, students who have more experience with computers, students who are from higher socioeconomic statuses, might have an easier time with this, and we might be measuring a construct other than the construct we're trying to measure, which is proficiency with um, being able to read tables and graphs. And here's another one. In this one, we're thinking about um, how to graph equations. So I have to be able to use this graphing function where I'm adding points and adding arrows and deleting things and drawing these lines on this graph. So again, it's not just my ability to draw a line, which I might be able to do with a paper and a pencil and a ruler, but I have to be able to use the computer to do this. So I just want you to be thinking about how technology is interacting with the way in which we're testing students for these high stakes accountability tests. And again, here's another example where I'm gonna be having to use these equation formulas here to um, answer this question. So let's talk a little bit about on these state accountability tests, who is tested? So who is tested? Um, all students with an asterisk. So, um, you know, all, no child left behind. We're thinking about all students here, um, including most students um, who qualify for special education services and English language learners. Um, we can have modified tests when an IEP includes accommodations, and that would account for about 2% of the population. So some of these modifications might include flexible presentation. So with the new computer enhanced tests, that might include text to speech. So in certain parts of the test, the test could be read to them. Obviously that wouldn't work for the reading comprehension test, but for the parts of the math, the math test. Um, we could also have masking, so making different parts of the test, different colors and those kinds of things. Um, if I had a student who needed to read in braille, yeah, I could give them a paper-based test, but it's important to note that that paper-based test isn't identical to the regular test because it wouldn't include the technology-enhanced items. Um, for larger text, though, we can just increase the text size on the computer so it can be an equivalent test. You can have flexible responding, so we can have someone else click on the computer for them. We can have flexible scheduling, so we can give them, and this is probably one of the more common ones, we can give them more time on the test. And flexible setting, which would mean giving the test in um, a smaller environment. So those last two are the most common modifications for the test, and you'll see that in the schools where students are given either more time or given the test in a smaller group environment. Um, we can give an alternate assessment for students with severe cognitive delays, and that's um, usually less than 1% of the school population, and those would be students who are working on alternate um, non-academic learning goals. So students who are working on daily living skills, things like, um, you know, toilet toileting or um, tying their shoes, um, basic self-care self -care types of tasks. Students who are nonverbal might be given alternate assessments, but again, it's, it's usually a very small percentage of the population who would be given alternate assessments according to IEPs. Most students will be given the, um, the regular test even when they're working far below grade level. Um, and including um, students who are English language learners. So even if they don't speak English, they'll be given that English test. It's, it's important to note that that's not true in all states. Um, in Florida, because English is the official language of Florida, we're giving this test in English. However, in states like Texas, where they have um, adopted other languages, or they haven't adopted English as their official language, they're given the test in their native language for up to two to three years. So let's look at what the scores on the EOC or the FSA test look like. Um, so 
The one thing to note is that even though the tests across grade levels are different, right, so the third grade test is different than the fourth grade test, they have vertically aligned those tests so that we can give a score on the third grade test that equates it to a score on the fourth grade test. Um, so we, um, so that's what that growth or development score on those tests, they're kind of equated so that we can compare growth from year to year. Um, give them a T-score and a percentile rank. So even though these are criterion reference tests, we're giving them a norm reference um, score on the FSAs. And then we give them an achievement level from one to five with a three indicating a satisfactory level. So if we look at these levels, one indicates an inactive inadequate level of success, two is below satisfactory, three is satisfactory, four is above, and five is mastery of the most challenging items. So let's look at some examples um, from the case study. This is what the um, FSA scores are going to look like on your um, in the case study that you'll be doing next week. So again, you might want to take a look at the case studies um, for next week. Take a quick peek, make sure that you can kind of interpret the scores so that when you're ready to write that case study up next week, you'll really understand what we're talking about. So let's take a look at Mark's scores here. So Mark's a third grade student, um, as you can see. Um, let's take a look at reading first. So his, um, his reading development score is a 191, and according to this achievement scale score from the Department of Education, that 191 corresponds to a level two um, in third grade. So normally a level two would mean that he wouldn't pass, right? That he, he had a below satisfactory score in reading. Now, one caveat is in third grade, if you score a level two, you'll still be promoted to fourth grade because it's your fourth, first time taking the test. So according to this, Mark would move on to fourth grade, but he would be um, on the edge. We, he's a student we're going to worry about, right? Because he's not really at that level that we would want for third graders. Let's see. Um, if we look at the different content categories here, right? Um, he has a 2 in vocabulary and reading application, a 3 in literary analysis, and a 2 in informational text. So um, this is where, um, looking at these scores, you as a teacher are really going to interpret and make um, recommendations for your classroom. So when we're looking at those norm reference tests, they're not going to tell us a lot about what we can do in the classroom. They're not going to tell us about curriculum, right? They just tell us how we can compare students to each other. But these criterion reference scores are going to give us specific things in the classroom we can do. So looking at this, I know as a teacher, I need to work on vocabulary and reading application with Mark. I need to work on informational text and research process, but he's relatively better at literary analysis and fiction. So I can work on using his strengths in literary analysis to build his skills in vocabulary and reading applications. So you reading instructors can think about what those scores mean and develop specific classroom strategies to help Mark be a better reader. So when you're looking at these FSA scores, this is where you're going to get those classroom applications when you're thinking about your um, case study examples. Okay, let's look at the... Um, so there you go. You can do the same thing in the math section for Mark. You can look at those same things for the development score in math and his relative strengths and weaknesses in math. So when you're thinking about those um, development scores, the norm reference and the criterion reference scores, I really want you to focus on thinking about those classroom applications on the criterion reference scores, the FSA and EOC scores, and also um, his grades on the report cards, okay? Um, I look forward to seeing your work this week. And again, if you have any questions, please send me an email. We can set up a time to talk in, the, um, in my office or on the phone. Bye.